This 2015 English-Greek movie begins with a monologue about the different interpretations about the power of being in love. As the narration continues, we have a shot of a library and a man walking throughout the library with a book. The narrator tells us that the ancient Greeks realized the power of love and made it a god, Eros. Because of him, many wars were fought, many lives were lost and all because no one could ever conquer his power. The man with the book approaches another man and gives the book entitled Second Chance by Robert J. Winsett. The receiver looks shocked and the narrator ends his monologue by saying that we all look different at first but we are so much alike when we are in love. The movie takes place in a socioeconomic turmoil happening in southern Europe where three different stories from different generations of Greeks falling in love with foreigners. The first chapter is called Boomerang. The scene cuts to a brunette woman walking around a busy street at night. She has short hair and seems to recognize most people she sees. On her phone, she walks around the streets of Athens when someone covers her mouth, and two men drag her from the street into a tunnel. The woman tries to get away, she is crying and screaming. We can't really tell what the two guys are trying to do to her as the light on that place keeps on flashing. A guy that was walking around saw what was happening and ran to her rescue. She is able to get her free and he tells her to run. The two men are trying to fight him, she gets free and stands there looking at the guy who keeps telling her to run. She finally runs away leaving the guy who saved her behind fighting her two kidnappers. Daphne, now safe, is in her room, laying on the bed, crying. We then see our hero, sitting on the street appearing to be fine with her phone, that she had left behind looking at some of her pictures. As he is looking at them, he zooms in on her face to see her in more detail. There is an old man inside a car when a kid trying to sell some boomerangs approaches the vehicle. The man stares at him for a while and then gets quickly out of the car and yells at the boy to disappear saying he does not want to see him. The boy runs away and the cars behind the man start honking their horns. He gets in the car and drives off. The same old man, Anthony, is in a room with a table and a chair surrounded by men telling his life story and how he lost everything he had. He used to have three stores of his own, a family, a job, a life, his dignity and says that now he is just struggling to survive. The man sits down and continues saying that everyone that he believed and trusted, left him. All types of people from operators to political parties left him by himself, he calls them useless. He explains how the boys selling boomerangs would steal his stores and that no insurance company would cover the damages. He tells these men that he only owns the damage that these boys left. The banks took everything he had and now he has nothing. The old man says that even with nothing he refuses to become one of those people who steal. He refuses to accept that that's what his city has become and does not want to sit and do nothing about that. He wants them gone for good, in any way. He tells these men that whatever they decide, he will support them and the old man shakes the hand of one of the guys closer to him. He is outside, near the ocean, grabs a boomerang that he had found in his car and throws it into the distance. It comes back but it falls. There is this woman in the next scene talking about how she believes that racism increases because people are under so much pressure that they can't think clearly or that they wouldn't be taught to think. Then we can see that that girl is in a classroom, most likely a college classroom where the teacher picks up on what she says and asks, the class if the ability to think is a luxury. A guy intervenes and tells everyone that if someone is in danger, this ability is a luxury. He then gives the example of Daphne, the girl that had been saved at the beginning of the movie. She takes over the debate saying that the guy that saved her was foreign and not a Greek. Then it cuts to a scene of the hero of our story walking around cars that stopped at the red light and trying to sell boomerangs and some other objects. He tries to sell to some people but no one buys his things and we see him getting a bit sad about it when he notices the girl he had saved across the street on a bus. Daphne is looking out into the street and she notices Ferris who is mesmerized looking at her. She recognizes him immediately, he just smiles, she seems scared and so she looks away. Ferris tries to walk forward as the bus takes off to still be able to see her but Daphne avoids eye contact. He reaches another stop of that bus and gets in in hopes she'll talk to him. Daphne looks surprised but keeps her eyes away from his. He stops in front of her and now she has nowhere to look. Once she does, Ferris simply asks if she is okay to which she does not reply. Ferris reaches his pocket and grabs her phone, giving it back to the woman who he had saved. Daphne takes the phone and thanks him. He introduces himself but before she could too, he sees a man verifying the bus tickets and so he leaves in that bus stop. As the doors close and the bus starts moving, we see Ferris smiling at her. Daphne is at home on her iPad watching a news report about a Syria war that is making the refugees run and become illegal migrants in Greece. The news reporter says that Europe as a whole has not been acknowledging the problem that Greece and Italy have been facing with the amount of foreign population they have been getting. The expectation is for 4,000 emigrants to be seeking refuge in other countries. As we hear Daphne listening to all these new reports and information about the Syrian war, Ferris is in a street where most people are refugees. He is trying to buy something when a group of men approach them, screaming and causing panic and destruction in hopes that the immigrants will get scared and leave. Everyone starts running and trying to get themselves out of the situation and Ferris is among them. 
The group of Greeks punch, push, beat and mistreat the ones that they can grab and destroy the stands completely. As they are running away, the group of emigrants get trapped between the group of Greeks who destroyed everything they had built, and the Greek police. Anthony is there, coming out of the police car. Ferris quickly climbs a ladder and tries to escape through a building. Daphne is still listening to what is happening and the news says that these people are trying to leave Greece as soon as possible because of how they have been treated, and most of them are trying to hide across the city. Ferris is still running and trying to find a way out, which he did. Ferris is now talking to two guys who have his passport and are evaluating it if it looks fake or if he could actually be able to run away. Ferris lets them know that the guy that gave him the passport has helped a lot of people escape before. The two guys discuss the possibility of getting caught and how they could help Ferris get away. Ferris pays them and one of the guys promises to let him know once everything is set. As he is selling boomerangs the next day, he sees Daphne again on the same bus and runs to go find her. She smiles at him and they both share eye contact. Daphne and Ferris are now in a park and they are both speaking English when Daphne asks if he speaks any Greek. Her hero says that he speaks only a tiny bit but almost nothing and his English is the same. She asks him where he is from and he explains that he is from Syria and that he is a Christian and that things are not going well for him at the moment. Daphne also says that in hers, Greece, things aren't good either. Ferris tells her that in there everything is easier because they do not have a war where the same culture fights and kills innocents. Daphne asks him if he studied back in Syria and Ferris tells her that he used to go to art school where he drew. He asks her back what she studies and she says she is in university studying politics. Ferris thinks that politics isn't a good thing to be involved in and that there are way too many lies. He believes that politics separates people and when Daphne asks about his family, he doesn't say anything. She says she has to leave and asks him where he is staying to which he does not respond once again. He decides to ask the girl he had saved if she takes the same bus every day. Daphne says that she does and when she tries to invite him to do something he interrupts her and says yes right away with a lot of enthusiasm. Daphne walks away. In the next scene, Daphne and Ferris are running around together holding hands and laughing. They walk around abandoned buildings, on a plane, and then he shows her his drawings. Ferris says that every time he sees something beautiful, he draws it so that he can keep it with him. He then asks her to pick one, she looks at him surprised and he gets closer to her and says that she can have his favorite one. He gives her a drawing of Eros that she immediately recognized. They both share how much they love the story of Eros and Psyche. They both laugh and after a while Daphne's expression changes and she asks him how long he thinks he'll stay in Greece. Ferris says that he wished he could stay forever but for obvious reasons he is not able to. He tells her in Greek that since he met her, everything changed. They both smile and Daphne kisses and hugs him. Daphne finds some sleeping bags in a wardrobe and when she closes the door, Anthony is there asking her what she is doing. She tells him that she was searching for the old sleeping bags for her friend Lydia, and tells him that they are planning a trip and she does not have any sleeping bags. Anthony asks Daphne, as she is trying to leave, if something had happened because he has been noticing her mood swings, how she is always disappearing, and she says that he has been doing the exact same things. Anthony asks if she met someone, and she backfires, asking if that was forbidden, to which the man replies that he would like to know if that was the case. Daphne tells him that she will let him know whenever she decides to. In the bus, Ferris and Daphne are sitting together and she falls asleep on his shoulder. He smiles at her and kisses her head while holding her hand. They go to the beach together and have a great time. The smiles on their faces are constant. In the water they share a passionate kiss and it gives the impression of the world stopping for a second. After all day at the beach, they find a religious procession and since Ferris is religious, they follow it for a while, and then stop to see everyone walking past them. While that's happening, Anthony is killing a Syrian refugee. The couple in love are still at the beach and now Ferris is trying to pronounce some of the words he knows in Greek. Daphne laughs and he keeps on telling her how beautiful she is and that he wants to be with her. Her expression changes when he starts saying other types of words and expressions that he learns such as saying that he is in love, that he misses her. Daphne asks him why or how he learned those words and expressions and he said he did it for her. Now it's her who says how much she loves, misses and is scared of losing him. The boy confesses that he wants to ask her to run away with him but that he would never ask her something like that. He said that he didn't want to do that to her. She kisses him on the cheek and he turns around and kisses her in the mouth by the fireplace at the beach. Daphne leaves the plane where her lover was staying and as she is walking towards home, she hears a child cry a lot and a lot of noise coming from the abandoned airport. She opens the door and finds a lot of refugees hiding inside the airport with no supplies or personal belongings. These people were living in a poor manner, and as a kid looks at her, she leaves the room, turning her attention to a door that was just across the passage she was at. Daphne opens the door to find a man standing there. She runs away, scared. That man went back to where he was and was worried that the Greeks had found them so he decided to step up and finish what they started. Anthony is complaining about the refugees hiding in the airport and says that they have guns and and stuff they steal from others. Anthony says that the Greeks are suffering from their presence in the country so they have to leave. Daphne is in class and they are debating whether or not the refugees are such a huge problem or even a main one. 
The guy who participated in the last debate is talking about how good and bad the situation can be and what it may or may not bring. The debate proceeds showing various opinions on the matter and while that's happening our female lead character looks bored and sleepy. At the same time, Ferris is showing his passport and getting on the train to leave. He hesitates and ends up not running away. They both get back to the plane and she is laying on his chest while they are talking. Daphne gets up, grabs a piece of paper from her things and tells Ferris what he had said to her in Greek but this time in his own language. He smiles at her and she proceeds to tell him that she doesn't care about politics, and she doesn't care if people think that she is making a mistake, he interrupts saying that he loves her and she says it back. They both kiss. Daphne and Ferris are awakened by the dozens of car lights that got into the airport. People start to panic and the chaos is noticeable and Ferris grabs both passports, puts them in his bag and they leave the plane. The extremists are shooting people and as they are running away Daphne sees Anthony killing a refugee and stops running. Ferris tries to make her run but she refuses. Anthony notices she is there and they both stare at each other in shock for a while. The scene cuts to a man and a boy playing a video game. It's a shooting game and while they are playing the kid asks his father if there is an economic crisis in their house. The dad tells him that there is. The kid asks him if parents stop sleeping together during economic crises, to which George responds with a question, wondering why the boy would think such a thing. The kid asks why his dad is sleeping on the couch and if that is something that happens to every couple, and the father denies the assertion once again. They both keep on playing and the boy keeps asking questions about his mom and dad's relationship. We then see the boy's father picking up a subscription from the pharmacy. It's raining and he is soaking when he shows the pharmaceutical the paper. This is when we realize we are on the second chapter called Lose F 50 milligrams. A brunette and elegant woman is collecting debt. We see the boy's father having a hard time and remembering his wife yelling at their son. He then is given the medicine that gives the name to the chapter. George remembers the boy's mother saying that she is always alone with the kid and cusses about taking care of him as he also screams. George puts his headset on and the music distracts him from the memories. He tries to focus on his work and the scene cuts to a woman, Elise. She is on a plane when she stumbles across a magazine that grabs her attention. It's about Eros and the myths that surround his story. She doesn't read it but instead leaves the plane, she has arrived at her destination. She enters her house and tries opening the window but decides to keep it shut. George is in a bar trying to relax when Elise interrupts him and asks him to stop smoking as they are in a non-smoking bar. George says it is not but the woman still insists on him putting out the cigarette. He calls the bartender telling him what she had said and the man tells him to do what she wants because he does not like conflicts. George follows the advice. Elise was working on her iPad when it shut down so she asks the bartender if he has one and he denies. George reaches into his bag and lets her borrow his. She thanks him and he lights up another cigarette. They look at each other and he smiles. Then we see the couple making out aggressively. They get undressed and make love. Then the scene cuts to them in bed, her bed, and she tells him that he has to leave because she doesn't like sleeping with strangers. He asks if she is sure and she says she is. She also reassures him saying that she liked their intimacy, but she prefers sleeping alone. He then accepts it and gets up asking her where she was from while getting dressed. We find out that she is from Poland. He starts comparing both nationalities and proceeds to insult her for kicking him out but since he did it in Greek she does not understand so she tries to explain that it's not personal, she just wanted a one night stand. George asks her if she is there on business, which she is, and how long she is staying there for, to which she tells him a few months. He then lets her know his name and finds out hers. They agree to maybe hook up again but do not share phone numbers. Before he leaves, he tells her that they both have something in common, the sense of humor and when she rejects his stay again, he insults her in Greek as he leaves her house. Elise falls asleep and in the next morning as she is getting out of bed, among the sheets she finds George, S. Pills. She analyzes them and throws them away. She prepares herself to shower and notices his scent on her skin. There is a party outside Elise's house and she calls someone to request moving away because there is too much noise. Someone rings her bell, it's George asking for his pills. She picks them up and throws them at him through the window. As she sits down to work, the bell rings again and Georgs asks Elise to have a drink with him downstairs. The couple is sitting outside and she questions him about the pills being antidepressants and tells him he doesn't seem to need them. George tells her that that's a good thing, it means he is using them well. Elise confesses never to have taken an antidepressant and tells him that she does not understand why people take those, in her mind, saying that life is hard is an excuse to take those pills is exactly that, an excuse. George asks her if she usually sleeps well at night and after she confirms it, he explains that it's not as easy to do that. He feels trapped and guilty and not able to provide. He tells her that that is the reality of his country, a country that has been facing a socioeconomic crisis. Using the same hypothetical story, Elise tells her one night stand that everyone is always responsible for part of their suffering. The scene cuts to the couple, once again in her bed sleeping. Giorgo was able to fall asleep and when she tries to wake him up, he is so sound asleep that he does not even hear her. She remembers what he had told her the night before and decides to let him sleep. She lays down away from him and he grabs her. They cuddle. Elise is now in a business meeting explaining to two men how she can be an asset. 
and what her goal is by working in their company. Her goal is to evaluate their staff and since they have an overstaffed issue, she will help them diminish the issue by helping maintain the more qualified individuals. As she is walking around the company that she will be working on, she stumbles across George. They both look surprised and they can only remember the hot nights they spent together. To not draw any attention to their affection, they greet each other with a handshake where we see his wedding ring as the focus of the shot. As George is about to enter the elevator to leave, Elise is there and they share an awkward silence. As the elevator goes down, they do not share a single word and George leaves. A man requests our main character to take him in as an employee in his department and here we find out that as head of department, he will have to work closely with Elise to help with the overstaffed issue in his company. About his friend's request, George asks why he would like to change and the man explains that he is afraid he'll get fired. The man shares his concerns and George tells him to relax but the employee interrupts him by saying that he can't relax and cannot afford to be fired. Proceeds by saying that no one will touch George's department as he has been there for 15 years and so they trust him. Our main character is torn because to move this guy into his department, he would have to fire someone who is already there. Odysseus, the man begging to be saved by George, asks if he can at least say something to the people making the decision, at least to the woman that is taking care of the investigation, Elise. Odysseus believes that since his friend is an executive, they will listen to him. George tells Odysseus that everyone has to be treated equally and that even if he says something, it won't matter. The man interrupts his speech and tells him that his wife is pregnant. The executive congratulates his friend, saying that that is what he wanted, but the friend confesses that they will get an abortion the next day, because if a company has 20 accountants that they no longer need, they will all be fired. George looks sad and disturbed, but the friend knows that he can't do anything, so he changes the subject, telling him that they haven't hung out in a long time. With tears in his eyes, and the knowledge that there is nothing he can do to help his friend, George watches the man leave his office. As he is about to leave work, George faces Elise once again in the elevator. The man asks if it would be unprofessional if he asked for a favor regarding a friend of his, and she says that it would. He tells her that his name is Odysseus, that he is in accounting and that he is a very close friend. George then has to see people get fired in front of his eyes, people he had been working with for a very long time. We see a big amount of people reacting to the news of being let go by the company. He is now in her apartment, while she is sleeping, looking over at her as she is laying by herself. Elise was able to reduce the staff 14% but the goal is 35. Her boss is on a call with her, pressuring her to take action and decide quickly which department should be abolished, and requests for her to call with better results as soon as possible. Elise has in her hands a paper listing the employees and seems frustrated at it. When we get a close-up, we see that everyone from George's team was fired and he is the only one left. She went for coffee and she is enjoying the climate and the music. Later, she's back in her bed and George is at the dining room table. The man decides to ask her a question. He asks why she had never asked about his wife and son and she replies by saying that she does not think she should care since she doesn't want to understand. She tells him that he walks around pretending that he has a great marriage and a great life. Elise reveals that she does not care about what she can't comprehend. They have a conversation about weakness and the woman tells him that she doesn't like weak people and that he is one since he has to take a pill to overcome his own issues. He asks her if she does not believe that falling in love can change everything and she once again denies. In Greek, he says that it's too bad because he fell in love with her. She asked him if he said it in Greek so she doesn't understand and he confirms that theory. She asks if he is not going to translate it and when he says no, she calls him weak and cowardly and insists for him to tell her. He gets pissed and gets up, jumping on top of her kissing her and stealing her laptop. She laughs, they are having fun. George is in a call with someone, promising them that they will get paid on the 25th day of the month, when he notices his friend Odysseus carrying a cardboard box with his belongings, saying goodbye to his coworkers. George looks shocked and hangs up the call, running towards his friend who looks back at him. They both share a disappointed look. Odysseus leaves and his friend stays behind and walks furiously back to his office. Elise gets into the elevator that she usually shares with her lover at the end of the day and holds the door for him but he does not show. Instead, he is at a bar, smoking and drinking away the sadness of not being able to save his friend. We see Elise the next day, looking like she could not concentrate on the job and thinking deeply. Again, we see the name of George on her list and it's the only name that is not crossed. She gets up and walks around the office, and as she looks over to George's office, she sees that his wife and kid are there. She crosses her arms and sees him playing with his son. She walks away. She is at home on her PC when someone rings the bell and she does not answer the door. She sips her wine and ignores the bell ring over and over again. Elise opens the windows and looks outside at a procession in the streets of Athens. George sees her at the window and finds out that she was, in fact, home. The scene cuts to them both in bed. 
He is showing her affection, and they have a conversation about how he wanted to give his son a good family structure, but in spite of his effort, he wasn't able to. Elise tells him that he has been doing to his son, the same thing that his father once did to him, he was being unfair. She tells him that he doesn't care about anyone other than himself. At the office, a guy walks into George's office and says that the board decided to merge two sections. So, ten more people were fired. Even though it does not affect them, he worries about the time they have left and questions the executive. He asks him why he isn't anxious about the decisions, but instead of answering the question, George just tells the guy that he is very busy and that he is not in a good mood. The man ignores George's clear request to be left alone and tells him that he heard something. Our main character tells him that he does not care about what he had heard but then he asks the intruder to tell him. The man talks about how love can get in between our judgment and says that with that comes the remorses and the feeling that we can't change anything. George looks frustrated and bored. In a shocking turn of events, George finds out that their friend who got fired committed George starts to cry over his friend's death. He is told that the deceased wife called, giving the news that he hanged He informs our main character that his friend's funeral will be the next day, and the widow doesn't want to see him ever again. We listen to a news report about how the fear has been everyone in Greece, with the rate of rising higher than it has ever been. The crisis has begun affecting even the developed countries, little by little. George is in his house, close to his wife and kid who are sleeping on the same bed, crying and looking at them. Then we see him with Elise. He breaks up with her. The scene cuts to Elise getting complaints from her boss, saying that it's unfortunate that they lost someone, but that their plans remain the same. She looks annoyed and like she doesn't want to be there. We then see her outside of the office in the elevator, and it seems like she is frustrated and can't run away from the problem. The boss questions whether or not she is still able to do the job that was assigned to her. Our last chapter is called Second Chance. We see a conversation between a woman and another man who invites her for coffee, to which she firstly says no. The guy asks if they can meet any other day, maybe next week, but we're only left with a thoughtful look on the woman's face. She does not answer him again, leaving the idea on standby. Their interaction gets interrupted when the woman's bus arrives, she enters, and he waves at her. The movie cuts to the day they finally meet, as we see the man telling her about how he ended up in Greece, being from Germany. After their time together, he gives her a present, and says he had been very excited to meet her. They schedule a date, next week, same day, same place, and start becoming closer and closer after every week. The man teaches her more about Greek history, the main reason why he dropped everything in Germany, and moved to Greece in the first place. He tells her a story about Eros, more specifically, a love story between him and his lover. The god fell in love with her, as soon as he saw her, and took her to his palace where they spent magical nights, only under the condition that she would never look at his face. She, however, did not keep her word and one night she peeked at him while he was sleeping, breaking her promise. She saw his face, which was even more handsome than she had imagined. She was so moved, but accidentally spilled some oil from the lamp on his shoulder, burning his skin, which made him wake up. He immediately told her that she betrayed him and they could no longer be together. He was hurt and abandoned her. The girl made it her life's purpose to find him and find her love again with God. For many years she looked for him, always looking for her second chance. Maria goes on to read the whole story from the book that we first see in the opening scene at the library. While we hear about this amazing love story, we see all of our main characters from all of the different chapters together above all, Ferris and Daphne, Elise and George, and Maria and Sebastian. We can see what looks like to be Sebastian writing the book and our characters living their romance. It's based on the same social and cultural crisis but from different points of view, which shows us that love can appear even in the darkest and most difficult times. Sebastian continues the god's love story. Zeus made Psyche immortal, and she and Eros got married. They gave birth to a little girl named Pleasure. Sebastian and Maria are back at the supermarket. He asks her if she would like to meet somewhere else. He's getting really impatient about seeing her again. He lets her know he's 65 years old and asks her age, and she says she is 55. She tells Sebastian that she is afraid of hanging out with him outside the market. Sebastian proposes for them both to do something crazy and asks her what the craziest thing she has ever done is. Knowing fully well that Maria was scared of meeting him in another location, he decides to maintain their supermarket date location, so he breaks into the supermarket at night but she is having second thoughts about doing this crazy thing. Sebastian had paid the guard to let them stay there. He turns the lights on. They're both looking around, she looks happy and overwhelmed to be alone with him in the empty supermarket. They dance around with some flowers, ride the supermarket cart, juggle with fruits, and pop open a bottle of wine. They end the night by having a picnic and playing a word game to learn each other's language. He puts up the word for making love, and she tells him that she doesn't play with that word, and then gently asks her if she misses it. The woman says she misses it a lot. Sebastian asks Maria if he could kiss her and so he leans forward and carefully grabs her face. Maria wonders if it's too late to fall in love, and Sebastian reassures her that it's never too late, and they kiss again. We see the moment where Sebastian gives the book to Maria, and tells her that even though it's in English, he really wanted her to try and read it. 
Maria is concerned about how big the book is. Sebastian tells her he will be glad to help if she needs it, and that the book is about a couple like them that get a second chance. The man tells her over and over again how in love with her he is, and that he does not have the time he used to, and that he knows how difficult it is for her. But he wants to meet her outside the supermarket because he always misses her. She replies back saying she misses him too, all the time. We see the same procession crossing the street that was in the other chapters as well. He asks her what the word means, and she says it means spring. Maria mentions that on Sunday, it's her grandson's birthday. She'll cook, and the family will sit around the table as always. She will be happy with them, healthy and united. Then the family will leave. Her husband will be watching TV, and she will be doing the dishes. She'll stand in front of the sink, thinking about what an unhappy person she is, because when she's doing the dishes, it's the only moment she has time to doubt everything. Maria looks upset and Sebastian tells her that everyone deserves a second chance, and it doesn't matter how old you are. Maria says she only needs a bit of time. At the bus, she starts reading the book again and Sebastian is walking the streets. We see the moment Maria talks about, when doing the dishes and being happy with her family. We find out that Daphne is her daughter and that Maria left the family to be with Sebastian. And that's why Anthony was the only parent in the picture when Daphne met Ferris. We get to see the whole happy family around the dinner table toasting. We then also find out that George is Daphne's brother. He is there with his wife and kid, talking about Anna, and how it's normal for a 40-year-old man to be with his wife and child. Anthony questions George about his relationship with Elise and if it was already over. He thinks the right thing to do was for him and Anna to stay together. He then, in private, also tells George to take advantage of whatever he wants to do with Elise, and then leave her for the mother of his child. George doesn't look very happy with the idea of using Elise, but the old man continues by saying that his and Daphne's mother is already sad enough with their economic situation. She doesn't need to also be dealing with unfaithful actions from her son. We realize Anthony is forcing George to attend the family gathering on Sunday, as usual. Anthony's goal is to keep the family together as it is and not of any outsiders get in the way of his ideal of a perfect family. Maria and her husband are watching TV and Maria looks devastated and unhappy. Elise is at her office talking to her bosses and letting them know what she had already requested. She wants someone to step up and take her place because it feels wrong to her. She also mentions that their initial deal should remain the same and that even though it's not her, the job should be done. We see her on a plane, leaving Greece, when she starts crying uncontrollably to the point where she has to take a pill, one from George, to be able to relax. The pill that she once discarded and insulted for not being an actual cure or helpful medication for anxiety and depression is now what makes her feel better. We're back at George's apartment with his son playing video games and him having the same dialogue as before. The man tells his son that he and his mother love him and that in order for them to be happier, they will have to stay in separate places from now on. The kid looks upset, and the scene cuts to George pushing his ring off the toilet. He also promises his son to visit often and to program stuff for them to do together. They talk about how the truth is hard to hear sometimes but quite necessary. We discover that the boy shares his name with his grandfather. The dad promises Anthony that he will tell him the truth from that day forward. The boy knows that it will not be easy but accepts it. He asks George if he can sleep with him whenever there is a thunderstorm, and his father tells him that he can sleep with him whenever he is scared. The boy seems happy with the response, they both smile at each other and agree with those conditions. George kisses his son on the forehead and both resume playing their game. We then see George looking up to Elise's apartment, but she is not at the window, so he walks away. Maria is in her bed, reading the book that Sebastian gave her and taking notes as the book is in English, and she has a hard time reading in that language. We then see Anthony in a car. He has a gun with him, rolled up in some sort of cloth, and by his side, a man. The man tells Anthony that the gun is for his protection because he never knows what may happen, and that it's always best to have one at all times. The man explains that all of them have one. Anthony tells the man that he will not need the gun, that he has his own ways of dealing with people who want to hurt him. The man insists that this is the safest way, and that things are very hard. He continues by telling Anthony not to be scared because their team always covers up for their own people and promises Anthony that he will never be unsheltered. Maria is in her room, still taking notes on the book that Sebastian gave her, when her husband tries to get inside the room. He finds the room to be locked and Maria quickly puts the book and the notes away and opens the door. The husband asks her why she had locked the door, and she replies by saying that it was an accident. He doesn't seem to believe her but ignores it and mentions that Daphne is still out and tells his wife to notice that she will not return until the next morning. He also informs that their daughter turned her phone off. His wife does not comment on her daughter's whereabouts but asks Anthony about his and what he was doing out. While Maria keeps on listening to him, he keeps on mumbling about how Daphne disappears like that all the time, and that he is sure that she has met someone. Since we have the context on all of these characters and their individual lives, we know that Daphne really did meet someone at that time, Ferris. Anthony continues by saying that he tries talking to her, but she refuses to talk to him back, and so, he asks his wife if she had had any luck. As he questions her about that, he unbuttons his shirt, and she notices that he has big blood stains on the fabric. 
He knows that she saw it and tells her that he can wash that off himself. Maria looks scared and uncomfortable, and Anthony still complains about how everything is ruined and has gotten out of control. He asks her if she had seen the new market on the corner. Maria reacts to that question with tears in her eyes, as it was the market where she and Sebastian have been meeting. He tells her that the supermarket was robbed. Someone got in and stole everything. Anthony is pissed and opens up to his wife about the state not doing anything about the refugees. He considers them miscreants and troublemakers, mentioning that they are camping in abandoned buildings. He tells her that they were found at the old airport with guns and warning her that they steal people. Anthony says that people are suffering from the presence of those people, and Maria sheds tears while her husband yells at her. He asks her why she is looking at him that way, but she does not say anything. He yells at her, saying that she resides in the same world as everyone else. Anthony asks his wife why she thinks he does all of those things to try and keep the refugees away, to which she responds by saying that he does those things because he fails at everything else. He turns around, facing her, and tells her to repeat what she had just said. Maria gets up, furious. She grabs her husband's blood-stained shirt and leaves the bedroom. She goes to the bathroom, locks herself in, and washes the blood off the fabric. Maria is crying, the blood is filling the sink, and Anthony is knocking on the door. He's yelling at her, saying that she is also to blame for what he had failed to do. He calls her a failure, saying that she never understood him and that she was never there for him when he needed her. The blood runs down the drain as he keeps yelling that she was never there when his world turned upside down. The movie ends on that abrupt note.